Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And the breaking news is out of the UK that Lucy Letby has been found guilty of killing all those babies in the hospital. Uh, I <laughs> hats off to the jury. I'm not fond of civilian jury systems, but I felt so bad for these jurors. Uh, they had to be there for almost what was it, nine months. They had to go through this trial uh, and they spent what I think it was 21, 22 days in deliberations. And I was afraid they would just be so overwhelmed with so many things and her little sweet face that they might just say, oh, the heck with it. I, we're going to find her not guilty. But they didn't. They found her guilty. God bless them. Because that had to be very difficult for them. And I think it is absolutely the right determination. Now, what's come out now is that all well, this, there's some articles about the case and her life. And people ask me why I never talked about this case prior to the, to the jury verdict. And as I said, it's because I can't find anything out about her, about her earlier life. Who was she? And now they have finally come out with some discussion of uh, her growing up, her parents, her friends, and her, what they call her very vanilla life. In other words, she's like, not, nobody saw anything coming. They didn't. She she seemed sweet and, and kind and and she had friends and her parents loved her and couldn't stand being away from her. And she worked hard to become a nurse. And only during the nursing part did some people see certain behaviors, like she got a little petulant about things, a little bit miffed when she wasn't given the the uh, duties she would like to have at the hospital with the most sick children where she would be able to engender more tension and more praise. So until then, people said, I had no idea. <clears throat> All right. And I'm going to link below a Daily Mail article, uh, which uh, criminologist David Wilson, um, a UK criminologist, and I have a lot of respect for him. He, he does a fairly nice discussion in that article about Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Um, and by the way, people jump forward and always say, oh my God, it's not called that anymore. It's called fictic factitious disorder. I don't care what the DSMV-5 says because they change those. <laughs> they always change terminologies just because they feel like it. And I don't like that terminology. I just don't. I like I like Munchausen syndrome. I like Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Yes, it, it was once named after some Baron von Munchausen who told fantastical stories and that weren't true, of course. And that's how the syndrome got its name. But I like it. I just like it. Uh, eh, I'm going to stay with it. And so did David Wilson. So, hey, <laughs> we agree on that. Um, uh, but he also said something I, I liked in the article and he straight up called her a serial killer. And that is entirely appropriate. And a lot of people will go with, oh, I don't know why she killed some babies or oh, she must have fictitious disorder. Mm. Or, but they don't get into the point that she's a serial killer. <laughs> now, if we have a male serial killer who's out there raping and murdering women, we don't like him. We're like, he's a serial killer. But when it comes to her, it's like, oh, you know, maybe she has some problems. I don't know why she killed the babies because she's a serial killer. <laughs> Do you understand? Now, Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy are not actually diseases. And people confuse this too. They think, oh, you know, Munchausen syndrome, you know, that's a person who uh, does things to themselves to bring attention uh, to themselves uh, or they lie about things that, that, you know, like we all know the Sherry Papini case by now that she was kidnapped, but she wasn't, but she wanted that attention and she brought that attention to herself. That's called Munchausen syndrome. And then when you hurt your children to get attention, it's Munchausen syndrome by proxy. But a lot of people think that's a, a disease, a name of a disease. It's not. The person who does Munchausen syndrome stuff and Munchausen syndrome by proxy stuff, they are psychopaths. This is psychopathy. And Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is simply a, a method that they use, the a behavior that they exhibit of psychopathy. All right. So Serial killers, male serial killers who go and raping, raping and murdering women, that, they're psychopaths who express their psychopathy through raping and murdering. Women 
often don't use that technique, it's not as useful to them. And they also have different methodologies to get the power and control because both of these groups, male serial killers, female serial, serial killers want power and control. So to get power and control, women often use the people around them in their normal lives. And this is why female serial killers are often those who exhibit Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Well, if they're killing, they're not doing Munchausen syndrome because then they'd be dead. But Munchausen syndrome by proxy is where you get the mothers who kill one baby after another baby after another baby. So you have two Munchausen syndrome by proxy type of psychopaths, um, those that kill their own children and those that kill other people's children. She's the other people's children type, but they're both serial killers. All right. So now everybody's looking at her life and going, but she's so sweet. And they're calling her through the entire article at the Daily Mail. Uh, she's a vanilla. Okay. She was. She exhibited sweetness. She exhibited a non, uh, what do you want to call it? She wasn't out there doing drugs. She wasn't uh, betting every bad boy in town. She wasn't doing bad things. She was a good girl. So sweet. So absolutely sweet. And that's how she manipulates. And I saw this article and nobody had anything bad to say about her. And I'm thinking it's because she played every one of you. You didn't see the manipulation. I, if I could get over there and interview all those friends and family, I would find that manipulation because it doesn't just pop up when she, oh, look, I'm becoming, uh, uh, look, I'm now working in the hospital with the babies. Suddenly I'm a psychopath. No, the woman has been a psychopath for a very long time. And she's been raised by a family who didn't recognize a psychopathy or even encourage a psychopathy. And then her friends, she picked those friends. She's not going to pick the people who are going to say, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> you're a lying dog. Uh, you're manipulating me. No, no, no. She's going to pick the friends who are going to go, oh, okay, okay, okay. And they're not going to see it. And that's why a lot of times when we have serial killers even who made it through high school uh, and people thought, oh, they were okay. Well, they weren't okay even then, but because you're teenagers, you don't see these things. And families don't want to admit these things. So these folks often get into adulthood without being recognized as being psychopaths until they commit all their crimes. So she was vanilla. All right. And she didn't seem the type that would do these terrible things. All right. And so what I'm going to explain to you, because I don't know all the details of her life, so I can't pick, pick through them. I cannot. Um, but I want to tell you a story, and this will help you understand exactly who she is. Uh, this is the story of Angela, and that's a pseudonym. Um, uh, many years ago, uh, I was a full-time medical sign language interpreter for the area hospitals in Washington, D.C. Um, and I worked in that field for 13 years. And I ran into some very interesting people during that time. Now, one thing about being a sign language interpreter is that when you go into the room and you're sitting there with that the person and the, the doctor, the, the doctors are busy, you know, they're bid, they're busy doing other things and seeing the other patients, you know. So what what happens? I chat with my client. Well, she's she's my client, but so is the doctor and the nurses. But anyway, that's a whole other story about how interpreting works. Anyway, so I'm sitting there with that person for many, many, many hours because I come through the emergency room and we wait in the waiting room for like sometimes six, seven hours, especially when they come in with minor little crappy complaints. And they're not coming in on the ambulance. They're just coming in to say, oh, you know, I've, I think I have a fever. Or my tummy hurts, you know. They're going to put you at the end of the list. So I spend hours with them. Then we go into the room and the doctors come in and all that. And I interpret for all the staff. And I get to see the person before, during, and after their visit. And all that time, a lot of times I'm like a fly on the wall. And because my client, especially if they're psych a psychopath, <laughs> views me as a tool, they often do things in front, say things in front of me that they know as an interpreter, ethically, I'm not able to tell the doctor. So if their behaviors switch up, I can't say to the doctor, whoa, 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 hey doc, she's lying to you. <laughs> I can't say that. So, but I could observe it. I learned a tremendous amount 
uh, for my later career in criminal profiling from working in hospitals. Not only did I see trauma, I saw rape victims, I saw uh, psychiatric situations, but I also saw psychopaths. Oh my goodness, more psychopaths than you can believe. It was a fabulous training uh, ground for me to become a criminal profiler. Um, who would think? But all right, so let me tell you about Angela, and this will help you understand how this works. All right, now, <clears throat> Angela, who was Angela? Angela was a sweet, a uh, very, a very, uh, she was a, a very delicate looking woman. Uh, she was uh, African American. She had a beautiful skin tone. It was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what to call it. It's just, it, she was so freaking pretty. That's all I can say. She was, she looked like a deer to me. That's always the way I, I could explain how she looked. She looked like a deer, like a little doe with the big eyes and the beautiful, like, she had kind of a, uh, I don't know, caramel brown skin. She's just beautiful, all right? Which helped her a great deal because when you're attractive enough, people don't suspect things as much. See, females use that. That's very manipulative. So she was, and she was, a, a slight, she was delicate, delicate, doe-like. That's how I have to put it. Well, I started interpreting for her at the hospital. She came in a lot. She came in with disorders, uh, you know, like, oh, I'm, you know, having problems with breathing. Uh, I, some, I'm a short of breath. I can't, you know, uh, whatever. And then they would do tests on her and they always came back negative. <laughs> and then she, they would always tell her when she was about to leave, they do this thing where the nurse will walk in and she'll read this paper and she'll say, okay, come back to the hospital if you have these symptoms. And... <laughs> And then she would list the symptoms. And after a while, every time the nurse came in with that paper, I'd start cringing because I said to myself, if you give her those symptoms, she's going to be back next week <laughs> with those symptoms. Sure enough, she would return the next week with those symptoms. <laughs> and she would do this over and over again. So I was learning that this woman was mm, probably clearly Munchausen's. All right. And then... It got more interesting. Uh, she she was very sweet. Uh, she was extremely sweet. And at some point, I remember that and this is a long time. This is like two decades, three decades ago. Uh, yes, I'm that old. And so she <laughs> she needed a place to stay. And I had had another deaf uh, a person stay in my house that I had met through the hospital system. And she had lived with me. And uh, she and her husband and her, her baby had lived with me for like uh, about a year. And they moved on. And and. Uh, dearest people ever. Um, and she said, Hey, you know, my friend told me, uh, this person I knew, cause the community is kind of small, told me that, you know, sometimes you have a place to stay and I have a, I have, I'm getting a place next month, but I need a place to stay for a month. And so I went, Oh yeah, whatever. So she came and stayed in my house and now she was very sweet again. She was sweet to my kids. Hi kids. I had two sons and a daughter. She's like, hi. she was sweet to them. She was not a problem. But then she started doing this interesting thing. She, all of a sudden I would get a call from the hospital and I go down to the hospital with one of her issues. And then she wanted to ride home with me. And I'm like, wait a minute, she's using me for a bus service. <laughs> and I'm like, so I said, I had to tell her, no, I can't take you home. And then she got what I would call, and this is a word that's very, uh, you'll see a lot with Munchausen syndrome people, petulant. <sighs> because I didn't do her bidding. We get petulant. And so anyway, she moved on and um, to her place. I don't know what her place really was. But anyway, it was, she was just there for like four weeks. So I knew her and I knew what she was like, but then it gets more interesting. So I get a call one night, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm uh, called down to Washington Hospital Center. And, and I said, what's up? And they said, we have a rape victim. Oh, and that's a very sad situation when you have to interpret for rape victims. It's really heartbreaking. So I go to Washington Hospital Center. I walk in. I go into the room, and there is a naked woman. And she's standing on a piece of paper with all the clothes at her feet. It's Angela. And so I'm like, oh, hi, Angela. I'm like, what happened? And she's like, oh, I was raped. I'm like, oh, really? And I'm like, I'm like, and it's terrible. You, hear, I mean, you know, this is a normally situation where I feel terribly bad for the person. But I'm like, 
do I believe this? <laughs> and, and I said, really? And she goes, yeah, you know, and I said, what happened? She goes, well, I was at, a, I got off the bus and this guy followed me and then he grabbed me and raped me. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's terrible. And, and then they came in, they did the rape kit thingy and then they went out and now she's sitting on the bed and she goes, so she goes, how are the boys? Are they playing baseball? And I'm like, odd behavior for someone who's just been violently raped that you're not having a chit chat about my family. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, they're fine. So anyway, they, everything came back and she went home and she didn't know who the person was. And I'm pretty sure the rape kit came back zero. Okay. She went home. This was now early morning. So, so I'm at home. I'm like, Oh, I gotta get some sleep. Hopefully the next night I'll just be able to sleep through the night and get, you know, won't be exhausted. So anyway, so the next night comes along <laughs> and, uh, I should not laugh, but oh my gosh, it's, 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 it is amusing in a very sad way. So the next night comes along, I get a call from DC General, which is another hospital in town. And they said, we have a rape victim. I'm driving down there at midnight. And I'm, as I'm walking into the hospital, I said, but it's Angela. <laughs> I walk into the room. It's Angela. I'm like, seriously. I said, you got raped again. She's like, oh, yeah. Can you believe it? I'm like, Nope. <laughs> no, I didn't say no. I just went, because I'm not allowed to say anything because I'm the interpreter. I'm not there to judge. And I'm just supposed to interpret for the patient and for, for, the, for the, um, the, the hospital staff. So <laughs> this whole process goes through again. Now, mind you, one of the two things she said each time was first, for, when she was in the other hospital and Washington Hospital Center, she asked for a, a sandwich. And she got that. Um, and then when she was in DC General, she got a little petulant because all she could get was crackers. So I'm pretty sure that she might have just come in for food. Uh, so she's perfectly willing to go through a rape exam to get some food and some attention. So anyway, that was that. And that was, you know, that's this is exhibiting Munchausen syndrome. Munchausen syndrome alone. She's claiming that she's got these problems, but she doesn't. But then things go go take it a very dark turn. She now becomes pregnant. She's in her early 20s. She's already been pregnant twice and two of those children were taken away by social services. Now she's pregnant for the third time. She, in the beginning, she's like, oh, I interpreted for her a lot. Oh, I'm pregnant, oh, I'm so excited. Oh. And then she starts coming to the hospital. I'm bleeding at home. And when they get to the hospital, they don't find any bleeding. And she's, then she comes in and says, I'm having contractions. But they put her on the machine and there are no contractions. So now she's playing this game. By the time she's about six months, she comes in constantly saying she's having these horrible issues and they start doing sonograms and all this type of stuff to try to find what's wrong with this baby. And it's one, one really, really unfortunate night. The first doctor does all this stuff with her and he goes, look, I see, I can't see anything wrong and I'm not gonna, she goes, I need a C-section. I need to say C-section, get the baby out of me now. And so you kind of see sort of a little evil side of her, you know? Uh, she's not so sweet, you know, she's mad now because they're not doing her bidding and she wants the baby out. Uh, so the doctor says, no way. But then the shift changed and a new doctor came in, did more tests and decided to do a C-section. I was absolutely appalled. I tried to tell the doctor, the girl lies and lies and lies and lies and lies. Stop. Don't do it. Don't do it. They did it. The baby was born early. The baby was born deaf, blind, and with mental, mentally, uh, what, what, I forgot what the words are these days, uh, mentally impaired or whatever the new terminology is. Um, that baby went to the Washington Hospital for sick children. And I didn't see Angela for almost a year. She was in heaven because she could go over to that hospital every day and have people go, oh, you poor baby, you poor mommy. And she got to be, she got so much attention for an entire year until that baby died. And then guess what? She got pregnant again. Yes, now a fourth pregnancy. So now I'm interpreting for her again. And the same things happen. She comes in when she's getting into the, in the, into the middle of the pregnancy toward five or six months, she's starting to have, oh, she's bleeding at home. She's having contractions. All this stuff is going on. So she can A, get attention and she wants that C-section. And they were actually thinking about when she was about six, seven months again, something like that. And I went up to the staff and I said, look, 
I'm going to break my code of ethics. They have a thing called the code of ethics. And I was like, I can't watch this and be a human being. The last time she's done the same things. Do you know what Munchausen syndrome by proxy is? Because this is what she's exhibiting. She wants to kill this child or she wants to make sure this child is born ill so she can get attention. And they, they just looked at me like, <laughs> because this is what happened here with Lucy Lepi. They didn't get it. People don't understand Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy. They don't understand that the sweet vanilla woman is a flaming psychopath and she's manipulating you and she will kill to get what she wants. In her case, she just wanted to have the thrill of playing God with a little baby. She wanted the thrill of being the one that was there, the one that was the, uh, to have that, be able to tell the parents, oh, I'm so sorry, and all that crap that she played. She wanted to be the hero. And Angela, she always wanted to be the center of attention, one way or the other, and she would get it one way or the other. So, amazingly enough, they didn't do the C-section, thank God, on the fourth child, and that baby was born. And so then I was interpreting for her after the baby was born, and the interesting stuff continues. So, remember, she's presenting to the public a very sweet image what I see behind the scenes is entirely different. So she was now, they came in to teach her how to nurse the baby. And she actually said, oh, please, can you teach me how to nurse my baby? With that doe-like face on her, she's so sweet. She's so pretty, you know what I mean? And she just had that look, you know? And the nurses would come in and they were like, oh, it's so wonderful to have a mother who wants to nurse their baby. And I'm thinking, again, lying dog. <laughs> But I can't say anything. So they show her how to nurse a little baby. And she's like, oh, that's how I do it. Oh, look at, oh, that's so sweet. And then she's like, thank you so much. And then the nurse goes out of the room and she, swear to God, this is exactly what I saw. She ripped the baby off her breast and said, I hate nursing and chucked the baby into the crib. <laughs> chucked it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. And I'm thinking, I'm hoping social services shows up really soon to take that baby away. But they didn't. And so she started coming to the, the more appointments, the pedi pediatricians. And she would sit outside the, the pediatrician's office with me. And she'd say, what should I do with my baby? Because she, she, she didn't have a motherly instinct. What should I do with this thing? Or my child. And I think about that, that time, I'm, I'm guessing, at, oh, wait a minute, that, about that time, I think the child was like two. And I'm like, she's like, what do I do with her? And she goes, what did you do with your children? Now, you'd think this is so that she could do be a better mother. <laughs> you would be so wrong. <laughs> that wasn't the reason she asked me these questions. She said, what did you do with your children at two? And I said, well, you know, I read books to them. I played games with them. Um, I... Uh, Let's see, let's play a book. I play, yeah, I read books with them. I played games with them. Um, and, you know, I spent, I spent time with them, uh, you know, having conversations and just, you know, trying to encourage their interaction with me, you know. So, you know and, and she goes, oh, okay. <laughs> we go into the room. The doctor says, how are things going? And she goes, well, I'm reading books, I'm playing games, and I'm chatting with my child so we can have interactions. <laughs> I'm like, okay. That's why she asked me those questions. She wants to present herself to the doctor as being a healthy mom, doing healthy things with her child. And somewhere along the, the, about that point, I, I can't remember whether she moved or whether I left interpreting to become a criminal profiler, but at that point I never saw her again. And to this day, I have no idea what happened to that child that Angela bore, unfortunately. Um, but my goodness, was she was like watching a movie on Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy, just play out before my eyes. It was highly enlightening. I'm going to say that if I had been an interpreter in that hospital and had to interpret for her, although she's not deaf, so it wouldn't have ever happened, I would have started seeing what she was really like. But a lot of people see only what she wants them to see in very small chunks. So they don't catch on. And she's such a good manipulator. She's going to make sure they don't catch on. 
And the few things that they might see, they're going to just toss off as well. Everybody has their days. Everybody has some times when they're dep like not getting the attention they want. So they're a little, they're a little bummed. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll come up with things that will then excuse behaviors because no one wants to say, well, I never have those behaviors. I'm a perfect person and she's obviously a rep. No, you don't do that. You know, we all recognize it. We are what we are. And sometimes our, sometimes we have our bad days and sometimes people go, wow, I don't know what's wrong with her today. Jeez, <laughs> I'm sure that's been said about me. So you don't want to overly judge other people for their little, little issues, you know? So she probably was very good at making sure those little issues only showed up here and there and not everywhere. But as a sign language interpreter for somebody like Angela, I saw it so often that then I could start putting, putting it all together and saying something's wrong with this picture. Now, the reason she got eventually caught was because she stayed in that hospital way too long, exhibiting at a certain point too many of those uh, behaviors. As I saw with Angela, the, the staff finally did start seeing that with Lucy Lepe. And they said, wait a minute, something is not right here. So she overplayed her game at the hospital. If she had been moved from hospital, if she had moved from hospital to hospital, she might have gotten away with it far, far longer. And there are many nurses and anesthesiologists uh, who have actually done so. They go from place to place to place to place. And that keeps them under the radar. Um, some of them also, uh, by the way, they work in uh, uh, nursing homes, nurses that work on nursing homes, especially the midnight shift where old people die anyway. That's a great location for Munchausen syndrome by proxy to occur, not with children, but with, el with the elderly. So there's, there's no way she was, did not have symptoms of psychopathy throughout her life, but she had doting parents who refused to, to, to accept who she was, to see who she was. And she had friends who she probably picked quite carefully who did not see who she was. And because she was able to at least become a nurse, uh, then she was able to hold a job that could put her in proximity of innocent little children to do what she wanted to do. Um, so she had the fortune, shall we say, of having enough of an upbringing to get good education and have somebody be able to pay for a college. And most of the time, serial killers do not have a successful upbringing. And so you see a lot of serial killers are not highly educated. They don't have great lives. Uh, they don't have great jobs. That's pretty unusual. Usually they're like this guy that goes from job to job to job and he's half the time he just broke or he's, you know, yes, he, he, he marries, but the wife dumps him pretty soon because she realizes he's a weirdo. Um, he stays with his girlfriend for a while till she dumps him. Then he stays with his sister till she gets rid of him. You know, <laughs> he goes from place to place uh, because he's not very successful in life. Once in a while, you'll have the great rarity of a serial killer who actually is a college graduate or uh, outstanding in the military. It's very, very rare. So when you look at the majority, my, my Angela was more of a somebody who would be in that situation um, because she, she, she didn't she couldn't achieve becoming a nurse because she didn't have the background to become a nurse. She had, a, she had, didn't have a good upbringing. Uh, she didn't get a lot of education. She was deaf, which makes it all more difficult to get good work. So she stuck with Munchausen Center for herself and Munchausen Center by proxy for her children. And I don't know what happened with the other kids. So my gosh, I, you know, <laughs> there may be stories I don't even know about. But for somebody, she was an only child, I believe. And so her parents doted on her and they had enough money. She had the fortune and society had the misfortune of her being able to blossom to the point where she could fool people in a profession and then get away with killing children, other people's children. And that's, that's pretty appalling. Now, sometimes people will, uh, sometimes you'll get, I say the midnight shift, uh, we will get um, LPNs, nothing wrong with LPNs, God bless you all. But somebody who doesn't have to have that high level of nursing and anybody can get a job working at a nursing home at the midnight shift because nobody wants that job, <laughs> you know? And so there's a, there's a higher rate of this kind of person getting that kind of job. So it's all very interesting, but for females, 
they are very manipulative, much more so than the male psychopaths. So, well, somebody going to say, well, no, I was married to a male psychopath and he was manipulative as hell. That's true. <laughs> Not denying that. But th this is a also a, just a very female way of being able to ingratiate themselves with in situations where people trust them, where the male psychopaths are more, sometimes in relationships, they're very manipulative and controlling and all that stuff. And sometimes very, uh, sometimes they have, you know, they can be attractive to women. Okay. Whereas the females, they, if they're marrying and committing, you know, uh, murders of their own children, they usually marry what I call adult, a guy who's just, Oh, she seemed like a nice girl to me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like oblivious to everything that's going on. Like, I don't know why my kids are dying. <laughs> it's because your wife is killing them. But so, so that's the way things work sometimes. But they can ingratiate themselves with people. That's kind of a, a female trait. We do have that, you know, the more manipulative trait. <clears throat> so, <laughs> I hope nobody comes here and starts attacking me for all those things, you know. It's just a reality. All right, men, of, men and women are different in many of their behaviors and in their, in their ways of handling life because they are in different situations and that's just the way things go. You know, uh, so you'll sometimes see certain traits that are more male and certain traits that are more female and that's just the way it is. Uh, and they use those, each one of those uh, males and females, psychopaths, will use those traits and those life circumstances to commit the crimes that they commit. She was extremely successful at committing those crimes for a very long time. And now she'll be in prison and little, it'll be interesting to see what game she plays there because one of the things about serial killers is when they get to prison, when they don't get the death penalty, they will play their new game there. They will start talking to profilers and getting books written about them and movies written, done about them. And they'll start getting love letters from, she'll start getting love letters. I, I think she likes men. So she'll get lots of love letters from men. She might get love letters from women too. And the men who are in prison, like Ted Bundy will get, Oh my God, Ted Bundy, I love you anyway. Either I think you didn't do it or I know you did it, but I just know that you have had something wrong in your head and, and now you're changed. Yeah. Cause you can't kill anybody in prison. So, uh, until so he gets married and has a child. Oh, makes me sick. Um, they will play a new game in prison. They're very good at that. It's, it, people always think when you put a serial killer in prison, they get killed. No, that's very rare. It does. It has happened. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer got knocked off, but he was annoying. So he just pissed somebody off. <laughs> he was an annoying creature. But most serial killers get along really well in prison and they get a super amount of attention. So in a sense, they get to continue doing what they always wanted what, the reason they're doing the things, they're still doing them for power and control. And when they go to prison, they get power and control again. She's going to get power and control again. Mark my words, you're going to see movies done about her. You're going to see books written about her. She's going to get all the power and control. And she will just bathe in it. Anyway, that's it. I wanted, I wanted to bring that to you today. I hope you enjoyed hearing how things really work in the real world um, from real experience. Um, and if you're new to the channel, please do like and subscribe. Support this channel. It's an educational channel, uh, and it does need some supporting. So thank you very much for being here, and uh, let's see what happens when she goes to prison. Bye.